What is J2B M205? It's a male line in J2B. Go to Phylogeographer to look at the samples. Click Viewer Migration by Haplogroup. Let's pick J2. It loads all the samples of J2. We just want to see M205. Okay, so by default, it's just showing where theoretical migration paths of the subclades of J2B M205 are, are computed to be from my software. But I want to show all the samples. Let's look at all the samples. Let's forget where it has computed it to be because I don't think it's correct. There isn't enough data from the mes from Mesopotamia, I think, to uh, in living people today and in ancient samples for the algorithm to be able to correctly compute it. So let's look at where everybody is from today. Zoom in a little bit. Yeah, that's much better. So there's a lot of samples in the Levant. I'm going to zoom in, show you where the two oldest samples are. They're from the Levant. The two oldest samples, this is Bronze Age Sidon, Sidon in Lebanon, now Lebanon. This is uh, 1600 BC, approximately. Other old sample, the most ancient sample of J2B M205, it's from now Jordan, Ain Ghazal, 2400 BC. These are the two oldest samples. They're both from the Levant. But this time period and the time period preceding it is just not represented in uh, uh, our corpus of ancient DNA, uh, Y-tested DNA from Mesopotamia. We don't have any samples. So there could be ancient samples in Mesopotamia. I'm going to talk about, uh, well, before I talk about it, I, uh, I think I think the origin may have been Mesopotamia. Before I talk about it, let's just survey where everybody's from today. There's a lot of guys from the Balkans. There's one lineage that is definitely was living in the Balkans 1,000 years ago. But we don't know when they migrated to the Balkans. And we don't know exactly where they were living before their ancestor migrated to the Balkans. It's one of the mysteries of J2BM205 that I, I have I, I have a hunch where they may have come from, but I'm waiting on some tests to finish. Um, there's also some guys from Italy and Spain and England and Germany. Uh, the German guy didn't do a uh, Y full analysis. Uh, I think these are all later migrations. Uh, actually, I can just mention it. There is an ancient sample from York, Roman era York, that is J2B M205. Autosomally, he's from the Middle East, beyond the shadow of a doubt. Uh, we have a lot of samples from Arabia, specifically Yemen, Oman, UAE, Bahrain, Qatar. Samples from Iraq, which uh, was Mesopotamia. Some samples from Egypt. There was a sample. In a, found in a mummy, but the mummy was, if I remember correctly, uh, Ptolemaic era Greece. So it's not so interesting. He's not that old. If he was an older mummy, it'd be more interesting to shed light onto the ancient origins. There's, oh, let's look at Anatolia first. There's, there are guys that are Armenians, Pontic Greeks, even Georgians. And uh, Kurds, Zaza, and ethnic Turks that are also in this haplogroup. Though this male line, when you look at where everyone is from today, anything that's a 6,000 year old male, male line, and this is where everybody lives, it's not Turkic male line. It's people, well, all in the ancient samples predate the when Turks came to uh, Anatolia. So these guys, they're, they are indigenous near east west asia uh ancestry quick correction to the egyptian mummy that's m205 he's he's from uh pre ptolem pre ptolemaic egypt about 600 650 bc abu sir el melek egypt 
And uh, here on the map, you see that the, where, where this ancient sample was found what is near Fayum. And there's a, a living guy who's J2BM205 from Fayum. So that's pretty cool. Uh, this ancient sample wasn't tested with very high coverage. So it's not on the y full tree. But maybe, maybe that guy's related to him. Because look, they're from all, like the same part of Egypt. And there aren't too many Egyptians positive for, for M205. Now let's look at Iraq. There's a guy from Iraq that is specifically from d -Car. And I didn't know where that was, so I Googled it on Google Maps. It's a governorate in southern Iraq. Dikar was the heartland of the ancient Iraqi civilization of Sumer and includes the ruins of Ur, Uri, Eridu, Lagash, Larsa, Girsu, Uma, and Bad Tabira. So these were cities of uh, Sumer. That's interesting. And I'm going to show you and talk about the possible associations, historic connections between uh, Uruk phase of ancient Sumer and some of the neighboring areas of the Near East, some, some uh, on the periphery at certain time. Other very important circumstantial data to keep in mind when thinking about where J2B M205, about 7,300 years ago, where that guy may have first lived, uh, the most recent common ancestor, uh, you, it's important to, to know where the other ancient samples of J2B that are this guy's distant cousins, but closest relatives that have been found in an ancient setting. Uh, there's two samples uh, that are pertinent here. One of them, the older one, is uh, J2B, uh, who split J2B branch, and uh, he's negative for all the subclades below Z534. His, he shares a SNP with a guy from uh, Uzbekistan. But uh, this, this guy is found in Tepe Abdul Hossein. It's not on Google Maps, but it's near, it's southeast of the site, Ganjdare. This is central Zagros Mountains. So this is a 10,000-year-old sample. He's the only ancient sample uh, that is J2B, basal J2B, you could say. Another ancient sample that's very important, it's the second oldest J2B. This is a fully formed J2B Z534. He's in the branch Z2534. And uh, from Haji Firuz Tepe, that's near Lake Ormia. And so this is called the Northwestern Zagros. So those are the only two uh, uh, Neolithic era and uh, samples of J2B. It's important to keep this in mind because uh, this would be the deeper homeland at least as we as best as we can understand it because those are the only samples that we have that are j2b that are ancient the haji firuz tepe ancient sample is 7000 years old and i said it's haplogroup wrong the, the haplogroup is z2453 and there's a more specific branch known but it, it's not important for our purposes here hi my name is Hunter Proven. I'm a citizen scientist. I'm not a geneticist. I am not a historian. I'm an, I'm an engineer. I'm a systems and information engineer. I write, I write software. Uh, I know how to use some data science techniques and write that in software. I've always been interested in history. And uh, I got into why DNA, the DNA of male lines, uh, after I did my own test. And I was interested in the results. I'm J2B. Uh, I'm not J2B M205, which this video is about. I'm their distant cousin that's mo that's uh, looks like it has a European origin, at least 5,000 years ago, uh, called L283. But I'm really interested in J2B M205. Uh, I have written two posts within the last year or year and a half about my insights looking at where modern people and ancient samples in M J two B M two O five trace their descent or or were found, and 
in those posts on my website, Philogeographer, I, I say that, well, there's a lot of really strong evidence. It's from the Middle East or the Near East, uh, but the most ancient samples are from the Levant. And so in, in my latest post, I said, I wrote that uh, I thought that the Levant was a likely origin or, but I was wise enough to say, or nearby, because uh, these guys are really from all over the Near East. I am the developer of several Y chromosome haplogroup research tools. Uh, one of them being uh, the Y heat map. And I'm gonna show you some of the diversity heat maps of various subclades of J2B M205 later on. I highly recommend for some interesting and relevant background information on Sumerian origins and ancient DNA, this YouTube, 30 minute YouTube video from January, 2021 uh, with geneticist Razib Khan. It's called Sumerian origins and ancient DNA. He will say some things that make you go, hmm. The Uruk period started about 4000 BC. Uh, according to Mark Va van de Mierop, Uruk was the first true city because it's so much bigger than any of the contemporary cities uh, and because of the large scale of centralization of the economy. People came into the city, traded goods, uh, donated goods or, or paid tithing to the temple, which uh, redistributed goods. Um, before the before the Uruk period, the it was known that the area in the Near East, it was called the Ubayid period. And uh, this lasted 2000 years. During that time, there were permanent settlements and there was a, just a gradual increase in the number and size of permanent settlements. And this continued until the Uruk period. And during the early Uruk period, uh, during the middle of the fourth millennium, the increase of permanently settled population in central Babylonia was minor and can be explained as the result of natural growth. But in the south, around the city of Uruk, there was an enormous escalation in the area occupied by permanent settlement. A large part of that increase took place in Uruk itself which became a real urban center surrounded not only by just one level of secondary settlements, but by a hierarchy of them, towns, villages, and small villages. And now I'm quoting from Mark van de Meerup's book, A History of the Ancient Near East, third edition, uh, page 24. The number of people who resided in Uruk's orbit at this time was so great that they could not have come from Babylonia alone. Some seem to have migrated from Western Iran and Northern Mesopotamia to the south, because Uruk is to the south. Mark van de Meerup is a professor of history at Columbia University. He's the author of many books about Mesopotamia and Babylon and Egypt, looks like. Uh, so he says that the population increased by so much so quickly in Uruk that it couldn't have been just from natural growth, that some people from outside of that area must have moved in. That's really interesting. And uh, I'm not saying that that's proof that that J2B M205 must have migrated into Uruk at that time from one of those other places. Uh, or, I mean, it, uh, if J2B, if the if it really came from the Zagros Mountains, then it, then then it would have had to come from that direction. But since we don't have any uh, ancient samples in this area of Mesopotamia, we may find that there's just as old J2B lying or uh, M205 or other branches of J2B in, in, in Mesopotamia as well, Babylon. Uh, so uh, maybe they were already there. Maybe they came in to Uruk during this time. Okay, let's continue. Okay, moving on. Now we're going a little bit further in time. By the mid fourth millennium, local developments in Western Iran, Northern Syria, and Southern Turkey, and other regions outside of Southern Mesopotamia became fundamentally influenced by Southern Mesopotamia. The nature 
of that interaction or influence is different from place to place, but in some places, settlements of urban proportions appeared on virgin soil with a cultural assemblage imported wholesale from southern Mesopotamia, such as Habuba Kabira on the middle Euphrates, which you can see on this map. There it is, Habuba Kabira. It means big Habuba in Arabic, by the way. Um, it was densely inhabited and a fortified city. Most scholars think that Southern immigrants founded these cities as colonies. Reading about Hububa Kabira on Wikipedia, just a little bit more information, it's kind of interesting. It says uh, it was built around 3500 BCE on a regular plain with strong defensive walls, but was abandoned after just a few generations, never inhabited again. And there's uh, several other sites in the area that are described as Ur late Uruk enclaves and outposts, including Arslan Tepe, Hasek Huyuk, Jebel Aruda, and Tepejik. Godin Tepe is a similar site in Iran. Uh, and when they say similar, they mean it's like a, an outpost or colony of uh, Uruk. So there was this great period of expanding influence and and uh, likely migration of people bringing the culture from of of Sumer uh, outside to other areas in the Near East and areas on the periphery of the Near East, like uh, Elam and uh, the Levant, like Syria. Um, then at the end of the fourth millennium is the end of the Uruk period, and for some unknown reason uh the there the, these links became cut off between sumer and these uh outlying areas the links stop and people stop uh people stop writing things on tablets like the way they had been doing them before and abandon this way of life that had been introduced in places where local cultures had adopted uruk practices indigenous traditions re-emerged. Village life and social organization became the norm again in northern Mesopotamia and in Syria. Interestingly, uh, even though there's this uh, decline in, in influence of Sumer in these areas where its culture had expanded to during the Uruk expansion of the mid fourth millennium, in Sumer itself, there, there, there is continuity of their culture and uh, their writing system becomes more complex in the next few centuries. And then it's starting to actually uh, use the, what we call cuneiform with the reed, the reed shaped impressions uh, into clay tablets. Then they start using that. And then instead of just documenting very basic transactions or, or, or very basic statements, uh, there, there's telling of stories like, uh, I had this territorial, I'm a king. I had a territorial dispute with this other guy and, and I won and da, 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 the gods love me. Um, then in the third millennium, in the early third millennium, certain regions became more closely drawn into the Babylonian orbit, including one that had been outside the Uruk sphere, the Persian Gulf. The Gulf gave access to Omani copper mines, which were crucial to the newly developed bronze technology. Babylonian interest in the region was thus not unexpected. Texts start referring to land of Dilmun as an important trading partner and a source of wood and copper. Dilmun had been attested only once in the texts from the Uruk IV period, but throughout the early dynastic, references to it became more numerous. Now let's look at one of the lineages that is found in, in Arabia and the Persian Gulf and also in Iraq. J FT58361 has a common ancestor, most recent common ancestor lived 4000 BC, which is the beginning of the Uruk phase. Uh, one line is found in a Canadian and Iraqi from Dikar. The other line is found in Kuwaitis, Yemenis, and Saudis. Now, the, the most recent, this is what the diversity map looks like. Um, if you zoom in, you see the individual samples. 
you have to zoom out for the this heat map software uh, only takes into account the samples that are on the page at the time. Uh, it's a JavaScript library I'm using. So uh, okay, in this in this instance, we've got a Iraqi branch and a an Arabian and Persian Gulf branch that have a common ancestor from uh, 4000 BC, time of the Uruk expansion. But uh, the age of the uh, Persian Gulf Arabian branch is pretty young. So we don't actually know that it became established during this uh, early dynastic phase of, of uh, Uruk because uh, their most recent common ancestor lived only 500 BC. Um, now, there's, there's another lineage, though, that we can look at. Uh, before looking at another one, uh, it's just interesting to note that the sibling of that lineage that I just showed you, one of their next closer relatives is a Jew from India. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know uh, exactly what the origin of the Jews from India are. I mean, they could all have different origins, but one of the theories that they have is that, that they are from Iraq. So it could be possible. I mean, for this particular guy who is J2BM205, who is a Jew from India, because he has his next closest relatives so far that have been tested, are found in Iraq, then it's a definite possibility that they could have come from there. It's also closer than the Levant is. Why 45447? Their most recent common ancestor lived 3400 BC. So this is the middle of the uh, Uruk expansion before the, the um, dynastic phase, before the decline and then subsequent uh, dynastic phase where they then have influence in the Persian Gulf. Uh, the lineages that are around Arabia and the Persian Gulf, uh, there are several and their most recent common ancestor lived also 3,400 BC. Uh, but the most recent common ancestor of, of each of these children of that line lived ranging from 1,700 BC to 500 BC to 1,100 BC. So the fact that all three of them are around the Persian Gulf uh, or Arabia makes sense that uh, the, the ancestor may have uh, migrated there around 3,400 BC, or it was just three separate co-migrations. One of them didn't go so far. They got one guy stayed in Kuwait, but these other two siblings went to Yemen and Oman. And uh, let's look at that on um, the diversity map. Why four, five, four, four, seven. Okay, now, I mean, this animation is, is not guaranteeing that that's where it started and where it went to. It's just showing uh, it's just slowly increasing the diversity that has been calculated so that you can see the different gradients. But this is all, this is a strictly Mesopotamian and uh, Arabian Persian Gulf lineage uh, from a common ancestor that lived 3400 BC. That's the Uruk expansion area phase. Now, this 3,400-year-old haplogroup that's found between the Persian Gulf, Yemen, and Oman, uh, its nearest relative is, the, is an Egyptian from Fayum, whose common ancestor lived 3,400 BC during the Uruk expansion. And now let me read this from page 40. Most intriguing is the possibility that Uruk influenced early Egypt, where in the late 4th millennium, a number of cultural characteristics similar to those of Mesopotamia appeared. Nished muck, mud brick architecture, decorative clay cones, some pottery styles, cylinder seals, and certain artistic motifs, that these elements appear in central Egypt and not in the north, suggest that the contacts were made through travel via the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea rather than overland across Syria. So this is really interesting, and I'm glad that I took the time to buy this book and read it. Uh, because I didn't know about these contacts that Mesopotamia had with uh, Persian Gulf states and, and Arabian um, civilizations. 
And uh, I just would have thought, oh, the proximity between Egypt and these uh, most ancient samples that we've found so far in Ain Ghazal, Jordan, and Sidon, Lebanon, I, I would have just thought, oh, maybe these guys uh, went to Egypt from from uh, the Levant. But uh, it could have been through uh, the other way, from Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. So even though the two most ancient samples, both dating to the Bronze Age of J2B M205, are from the Levant, it's, it's important to understand that the Levant at this time was the periphery of the of the Near East and the distribution of uh, of J two B M two O five more corresponds to I think a Sumer mediated uh, sequence of migrations. There's at least two good explanations of how. Uh, uh, a male line may have migrated from Babylonia uh, before 1650 BC, or I mean, even before 2400 BC, uh, to the area of the Levant. Uh, it could have been in the initial Uruk expansion, which was in the mid fourth millennium BC, or it could have even been later in the dynastic phase, because uh, by the middle of the third millennium, um, we have texts at Ebla state that the young scribes came up from Mari, which suggests, and you can see on the map here, Ebla and Mari, which suggests that the city provided training to Syrian scribes. People from Western Syria read the same texts as those of Southern Iraq. They employed the same scribal practices, shaped their clay tablets similarly, wrote the same cuneiform signs, organized them in the same way on the tablets, and so on. Politically, they were separate, however, living in independent city-states. So uh, someone had to have taught these guys how to use this new writing method that was developed in, in Babylon, Babylonia, rather. So uh, so there's these two, the, the there are many different opportunities for because of the continuing initial and then continuing cultural contacts with uh, Babylonia to uh, Mari and Ebla. Okay, so that's all that's all I have. Um, I guess we will see whether or not we ever find ancient samples from Mesopotamia dating to this period and whether there are any J2B M205 from uh, Sumer or Babylonia. Uh, I'll talk a little now about uh, this one Balkan lineage uh, of J2B M205. Uh, it's there. No, wait. So I'll talk a little bit about this Balkan lineage of J2BM205 known as Y22059. Uh, these guys all descend from one man that lived a thousand years ago. That guy must have been living in the Western Balkans. These guys are living, uh, I think most of them are Serbs, but they are found in almost all of the neighboring countries of the Western Balkans, even in Romania and in Greece. Um, before I go into my thoughts, I I just want to share what somebody who may probably he is in this lineage himself. He shared on my website when I wrote a post about J2BM205. He said uh, because of people's surnames, it confirms that this branch is a pre-Slavic tribe of Krecha that lived on the territory between the Tara River in the south and the Lim River in the north. But this does not mean that all of the J2B Y22059 are from the aforementioned tribe. Okay, well, anyway, uh, I think we have no idea if it could be pre-Slavic or not because it's we only have um, a TMRCA from 1,000 years ago, and that's several centuries after the Slavs already came. Um, so I, I think the most... I think if you if you're trying to figure out how someone some male ancestor 
from Anatolia or the Near East migrated to the Western Balkans 1,000 years ago, I think we should look first and foremost at the Byzantines because they are famous for moving people around. The book I read by uh, John V.A. Fine, uh, he mentioned that they moved a lot of Armenians to uh, the Balkans to, to strengthen their borderlands. People that might be causing problems back home, you move them somewhere else and then they can't unite with other people to cause problems because they're all foreigners and they all will fight each other. It's like divide and conquer kind of politics. Put them in the, on the borders and then if anyone gets attacked, it's these guys have to deal with it. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's also interesting. I mean, I don't, I don't have any proof that, that that's where uh, these guys came from. Um, I, I am waiting on the result of a, a guy from Turkey uh, to test a SNP, and then we'll see. But even if this guy that I'm testing from Turkey, even if he breaks their bottleneck, which started 2400 BC, even if he breaks their bottleneck, uh, his STR differences to these guys are so great that uh, it, it would not prove that the migration would have been in 1000 AD, but it would still give some circumstantial evidence as to where they originally came from. And it would narrow the window down somewhat. If you'd like to advance the research into J2B M205, I'm happy to advise on which samples would probably advance the research based on uh, their STRs. What, what which branches they appear to be, which bottlenecks they might break, uh, places of interest geographically that could uh, shed light on the deeper origin. Uh, but these tests cost money, and I can't. I'm not going to pay for these tests. I don't have money for that. But if you have money, you want to buy these tests, I will advise you. Uh, also, um, I do consulting for forty dollars an hour. You can contact me, HunterProven at gmail.com. Thank you.